intro and such. All right, go live. All right, hello everyone, we are live. Um, I'll wait a minute before we get started so that we start at noon. Okay, I think it's noon mountain time. So I'll go ahead and get started making the introductions. I see 10 people in the audience so far. Hopefully more will join us. Um, hello, my name is Murtaza Karim Zadeh. I moderate this talk. Um, uh, I'm an assistant professor of geography here at CU Boulder. Um, today's talk, we are very privileged to have Dr. Monica Webb Hooper uh, Deputy Director, National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities of NIH. Dr. Hooper um, <clears throat> works closely with the director, Dr. Perez Stable, and the leadership to oversee all aspects of the institute and to support the implementation of the science vision and recommendations to improve minority health, reduce health disparities, and promote health equity. Dr. Hooper also co-leads working groups for NIH-wide initiatives to understand and address disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 among populations with health disparities. Um, Dr. Hooper is an internationally recognized translational behavioral scientist and licensed clinical health psychologist. She has dedicated her career to scientific study of minority health and racial and ethnic disparities, fo focusing on chronic illness prevention and health behavior change. Her program of community engaged research focuses on understanding multi level factors and bio, um, biopsychological uh, me mechanisms underlying modifiable uh, risk factors, such as tobacco use, stress processes, and the development of uh, community responsive and culturally specific interventions. Um, so, with that being said, again, we are very pleased to have Dr. Hooper. Um, the title of her talk is Racial and Ethnic Disparities in the Age of COVID-19, Heightened Emphasis on Long-Lasting Problems. Before I invite Dr. Hooper to start your talk, just a note, you can say hi and post your questions in chat to the right of this window, signing using your personal Gmail account. Um, and I will be reading the questions to the speaker after the talk. So the talk will perhaps take around 45 minutes and we will do our best to wrap up in an hour. Um, welcome, Dr. Hooper, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that kind introduction. I'm just delighted to participate. I want to thank the Colloquium Committee for inviting me. Um, and I think, you know, we are, everyone knows that this really interesting, challenging, and unprecedented time in U.S. history, this is a time when people are discussing social inequities and addressing health disparities more than we have in the past. And that includes change within the domain of science and how we can advance health equity. So today I wanna to talk about a few areas, health disparities, COVID-19, training opportunities, and opportunities to support diverse cohorts of scientists. So before I get started, just a little disclaimer that the views I express do not necessarily reflect those of the NIH or the United States government. So as we move into this conversation, I offer three key definitions for context. The first is population differences. These are characteristic differences between population groups such as prevalence. And the key is the linkage to genetics or biology or geographic location. Gene environment interactions translate into differences in disease susceptibility. So key differences in colorblindness or the prevalence, um, the greater prevalence of sickle cell anemia among Americans of African descent or Mediterranean heritage are, are good examples of population differences. 
this is the definition of healthy people, um, healthy people's definition of health disparities. And I think it's my favorite definition of health disparities. These are a particular type of health difference. It's caused by disadvantage at multiple levels, such as social, economic, and environmental. The populations who experience health disparities are those who have faced systematically greater obstacles to greater to optimal health. And they can be characterized, these groups, in a number of ways, including by race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, and others. Groups that are often discriminated against or excluded. And importantly, health disparities do not have to exist, and they are modifiable. Health equity is a term often used interchangeably with health disparities, but has a distinct meaning. Health equity is the aspiration. It's the highest level of health for all people. To achieve health equity requires that we close the gaps, which are healthcare disparities, that we value everyone equally, address avoidable inequalities, provide supports that are proportional to the needs, and remove barriers to optimal health. And then the third definition that I wanted to share as we get started in this conversation is the definition of social determinants of health. This is also healthy people's definition, and social determinants refer to conditions in the environment in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, um, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. Now, the word conditions is important to note. It is the conditions of our environment and interactions that affect our physical, our mental, emotional, and material statuses. Social determinants of health are not negative per se, although this is commonly how they're discussed in the literature. Some of the determinants increase the odds of good health, such as having clean air, water, great school systems, and appropriate social support. Now, the goal is for everyone to have positive and protective social determinants in their lives consistently. And importantly, the social determinants are mostly place-based and thus are also modifiable. This means that those determinants that do lead to adverse impacts on health and those that facilitate health disparities do not have to exist. They can be modified. Examples of social determinants include, for instance, the availability of healthy foods, opportunities for high quality education and employment, access to quality health care, public safety, safe and affordable housing, social norms and attitudes, things like discrimination, racism, and distrust of government, and also the built environment. So these and other social determinants combine to create influence on health outcomes. But I'd like to make sure that we're all on the same page about this because some of these terms are used interchangeably. It is important, language does matter, and it's important that we understand the distinction. Now, as we talk about health disparities, these are not new. Indeed, they are very long standing and have existed for centuries before they were studied or before we had a term to define them. Health disparities represent a pandemic in their own right. And the study of disparities really emerged as a cross cutting area of scientific study in the 1980s. And although there has been some progress in some areas, we still have a long way to go. So, when did the science of health disparities really gain traction and why? The short story is that the Task Force on Black and Minority Health was established by Secretary of Health and Human Services, Margaret M. Heckler, in response to the striking differences in health status between many racial minority populations in the U.S. and the majority population. Mrs. Heckler noted that the health and longevity of all Americans had continued to improve, but the prospects for living full and healthy lives were not shared equally by many racial ethnic minority Americans. And among the most striking differentials was the gap of more than five years in life expectancy between African Americans and white Americans, and also in the infant mortality rate, which for African Americans was twice that of whites at that time. And Mrs. Heckler created a special secretarial task force to investigate this sort of grave health dis discrepancies that were observed 
and established an Office of Minority Health to implement recommendations from the task force. And this at the time was a significant measure toward developing a coordinated strategy to improve the health of all racial ethnic minority populations. And after initial review of the national data, the task force adopted a study approach based on the statistical technique of excess depth to define the differences in minority health in relation to non-minority health. And this method dramatically demonstrated the number of deaths among racial ethnic minorities that would not have occurred had mortality rates for minorities equaled those of non-minorities. And the analysis of excess deaths revealed that six specific health areas accounted for more than 80% of the annual higher proportion of racial ethnic minority deaths. And these areas were cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases, cancer, chemical dependency, diabetes, you know, homicide, suicide, intentional injuries, infant mortality, and low birth weight. So the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities is the youngest NIH Institute, and we are celebrated in 2020 our, our 10th anniversary. The Institute was a center for 10 years before that and an office for 10 years before that. So we have come a long way. And our mission is to work across NIH and the Department of Health and Human Services more generally to advance the science of health disparities and move us closer to meaningful progress. Because in the 35 years since the Heckler Report, almost 36 years, health disparities persist. The NIH has designated certain U.S. populations to be considered health disparity populations. I prefer to say populations who experience health disparities, and they include those on the list that you see here. So in addition to racial ethnic groups, these populations include socially, um, socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, underserved rural populations, and sexual gender minorities as well. The NIMHD Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Framework reflects this evolving conceptualization of factors that are relevant to our understanding of minority health and health disparities and how we promote better health through science. And the framework serves as a vehicle. We encourage NIMHD and NIH-supported research that addresses the very complex and multifaceted nature of these issues including research that span different domains of influence. And domains include things like biology, behavior, physical, built environment, structural environment, sociocultural factors. And then there are different levels of influence. You might look at things, for instance, at the individual level, the interpersonal, community, societal levels within the domains of influence. So fast forward to today. There are still considerable racial, ethnic disparities in most health conditions. And these disparities still include shorter life expectancy, higher rates of cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, infant mortality, stroke, cognitive impairment, asthma, sexually transmitted infection, and dental diseases. And also we have differences in the prevalence and outcomes of mental illness. So looking more closely, just one of these outcomes, life expectancy, we have seen some improvement here. However, data on overall life expectancy indicate that African-American males have the lowest life expectancy and Latino males have the longest. The same pattern is observed by race ethnicity when you look at um, women. When we look at socioeconomic factors, we can see in this figure that there's a strong negative gradient in the risk of all-cause mortality in the U.S by annual household income level. These data were from 2016, and they show that the risk of death from any cause is three times greater among individuals whose household income is less than $25,000 per year. So income alone is independently related to life and death. Now let's talk about the pandemic, which we can all agree continues to take such a toll on the world. In 2020, COVID-19 was one of the leading causes of death in the United States. And the statistics are very staggering. And I always say it's important that we remember that there are real people behind and families behind these numbers. When we discuss COVID-19 and its many impacts, we must talk about health disparities. 
These are national data from the CDC, which indicate racial ethnic disparities in COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and mortality. A few examples I've highlighted in the purple boxes. Compared to white individuals, COVID-19 cases are 1.8 times higher among American Indian or Alaska Native persons. Hospitalizations are over four times higher among Hispanic or Latino individuals. And deaths are nearly three times greater among Black or African American persons. And an important point, again, about health disparities, that these are differences that do not have to exist. They should not exist. They are modifiable, which means that we have the opportunity for change. Now, these data are from the National Vital Statistics System, which compared the weekly mortality average of deaths per week between 2015 and 2019 to the average deaths per week between January 26th and October 3rd of last year. So this analysis included 99.8% of U.S. residents, all 50 states and Washington, D.C. Now they estimated over 299,000 total excess deaths from January through October of last year and 66% of them, which is 198,081 people, they were attributed to COVID-19. And we know that after October, so this analysis ended in October, after the last three months of the years, those numbers further skyrocketed. And the largest percentage increase compared to 2015 through 19 was among Latinos, 53.6%. You also notice that the percent increase was greater among all racial ethnic minority groups compared to white individuals. Now, what is not shown here is an analysis by age group, which showed that adults aged 25 through 44 had the largest increase in deaths per week, which was 26.5%. Now, there are two overarching possibilities for racial ethnic disparities in COVID-19 cases and outcomes. I think medical comorbidities is what we hear and read about the most, and especially early on from scientists, physicians, and health officials. Racial ethnic minority groups have a disproportionate burden, indeed, of underlying comorbidities. So I think a simple conclusion would be the possibility that maybe there's something, you know, genetic or biological happening here that may be predisposing racial ethnic minority groups to more severe disease and higher mortality. The problem with this explanation, however, is that it is absent the full context of the pandemic and of society. It is important that we zoom out a bit to view the full context here, which includes systemic factors such as historical and ongoing discrimination and chronic stress. And also, you know, we know chronic stress has effects on immunologic functioning and health. So early on in the pandemic, I developed a model to help me think about factors that contribute directly to COVID-19 cases and outcomes. And I think COVID-19 is, is just illustrative of the overarching health disparities in the US more broadly. Now the factors in this model can be seen as related to health and healthcare, socioeconomics and social determinants of health. And we can't ignore this backdrop of structural inequities which are associated with poor health outcomes. And there's been a lot reported um, in the news and in articles about racial ethnic minorities being employed in essential jobs that force exposure to the virus. And that's true. And to give one example, um, in the field of nursing, nurses are mostly women and nurses of Fil Filipino descent comprise just 4% of the US workforce, but nearly a third of registered nurse deaths due to COVID-19 identifies Filipino. And this represents the largest racial ethnic minority group to die of the disease within that specific workforce, followed by African-American nurses. So COVID-19 racial and ethnic disparities are driven by differences in exposure. There is a structural issue that is taking place here, and I think one that has rightfully gained more attention rather than a biological or a genetic one. So we've covered old health disparities, current disparities, and new disparities. The synergistic effects of these we don't yet know, but it is time for meaningful change. So how can scientists play a role in reaching this goal, the goal of, of health equity? The answer here is complex because equity work is hard, but I do implore you to do the work. For the sake of time, I will just offer two areas on which scientists can focus in terms of their, of their actual science 
and that are also within their domains of control. Um, and you know, this this research base is evolving, and it's moving. The goal is to move towards effective, sustainable interventions that are widely disseminated and implemented. Um, I also will talk next about um, focusing on building the pipeline, or should we say the pathways, better than pipelines, pathways in terms of training and supporting the careers of the next generation of health disparity scientists through inclusive excellence and equity. So let's talk about the science part first. COVID-19 has, I think, really encouraged a refocus on community-engaged research that is working with the affected communities to develop, execute, and evaluate interventions that actually resonate and fill the needs of populations. So NIH has several initiatives that are significant and ongoing to address the needs of underserved and vulnerable communities. I'll talk about two of them. The first is the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics Underserved Populations, or RADx up initiative. And the way this initiative really got started was the NIH Office of the Director received a $1 billion congressional appropriation for COVID-19 research. And that developed the RADx initiative and includes the four components that you see listed here. NIH then committed half of that appropriation, so $500 million to study COVID-19 diagnostics specifically among underserved and vulnerable populations. And this is the major initiative that we refer to as RADx, uh, RADx Up or RADx UP. It's also noteworthy that this is, to my knowledge, knowledge, the largest NIH investment in health disparities research for a single initiative. So it's very significant. Here are the primary strategies within RADx Up, including that we're that we're employing in these projects, and that includes um, expanding testing capacity in these priority underserved and vulnerable populations, including those individuals who are asymptomatic. Uh, projects are deploying point of care tests, informing the implementation of public health measures to mitigate the spread and effects of the pandemic, including quarantining and contact tracing. Also, we are focused on understanding the range of factors, which are complex, that contribute to COVID-19 disparities. And RADx Up really is establishing an infrastructure that can help with the implementation of vaccines, potentially, and the use of therapeutics for, uh, for, for COVID-19. And because we recognize the complexity of the factors that lead to greater exposure among underserved groups, the RADx Consortium and the RADx Up Consortium in particular includes a specific program focused on addressing the social, ethical, and behavioral implications of testing underserved groups. So what are the testing-related concerns expressed within underserved communities? What are the barriers to accessing tests or seeking them? And if someone receives a positive test, what are the next steps, especially among individuals who may not have the privilege of being able to self-isolate? And how do we make sure that patients interpret their test results correctly? So these studies will assess ethical, historical, healthcare, economic, and contextual factors surrounding testing for COVID-19, as well as examining factors such as cultural beliefs and attitudes and also preferences for various forms of diagnostics. So this is a snapshot of who was funded or where geographically we have funded sites for phase one of RADx Up. I should mention it's a two phase initiative. We've funded phase one and we're currently in the planning stages for phase two. Now in this map, the darker the color, the greater the number of awards in the state. So as you can see there, um, there's a span here of 31 states in addition to Washington DC and Puerto Rico and awards made at 54 institutions. This is a summary of the health disparity populations or populations with health disparities that the RADx grants are focused on, RADx UP grants. They include Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, American Indians, sexual and gender minorities, socioeconomically disadvantaged individuals, underserved rural populations, and Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. So we really have met, I think, the goal of ensuring that NIH-designated populations with health disparities are well represented in terms of our focus of addressing access and testing issues um, in populations that are hardest hit. We're also focused, aside from race ethnicity, on COVID-19 medically and socially vulnerable populations, 
And these would include groups who are at especially high risk of exposure and potentially worse outcomes. And these are just a sampling of the groups who meet this description. And as you, as you can see, most of the projects you know, do include a focus on those individuals and populations with high rates of medical comorbidities, rural communities, immigrant populations, and, and so on here. And this is the second half of that table. It's a long table and illustrates more of the vulnerable populations that RADxUp is prioritizing. So they include homeless populations, communities with high levels of air pollution, uh, and pregnant and postpartum women. So engagement, community engagement, really important. Um, we need to work with the affected communities, and that is a cornerstone of this Radix Up initiative. You know, too few studies include racially and ethnically diverse patients or community members in how they develop their studies and implement them. And then as a result, we have sort of a contextually developed interventions that may largely benefit health outcomes in one sector of society, while inadvertently creating, sustaining, or even increasing health disparities in another. So in RADxUp, we want the heart of this very large initiative to be community engagement, working with partners in the community for co-producing research in these communities through improved health and receipt of high quality healthcare. So all of these projects are you know, engaging in co-learning, working on building trust and transparency with our research process. And importantly, the Radix Up Consortium, because it's so big and has so many different institutions and projects, it's linked by a coordination and data collection center, what we call our CDCC. And the CDCC is providing overarching support and guidance in a number of areas. And I show you this just to really point out of how complex this kind of initiative is to stand up. And we're really uh, excited and proud of the work that is happening um, in this effort. This is actually, the coordinating center is a, the, it's four year project, probably five, $80 million cooperative agreement that was awarded to Duke University. So shifting to a different initiative, you know, we are all hoping to end this pandemic as soon as possible. And to do that, one of the things that will be important is widespread acceptance of COVID-19 vaccines and across all populations is critical. So the SEAL initiative, which is the Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities, is working on this from a national perspective that is debunking uh, misinformation and building trust, particularly in uh, disproportionately affected population. So we know that while some of us are all very, are very excited about getting vaccinated against COVID-19, not everyone is sharing in this relation. And among the concerns, um, the data point to low willingness to get this vaccine. And um, these are survey findings reported in December. And actually these numbers reflect improvement. It's about 9% improvement between overall between September and December in terms of nine percentage points in people's an increase or showing greater willingness to accept a COVID-19 vaccine. But the percentages still are much lower than what we need to see. Particularly if you look at African-Americans at about 40%, but the percentages among um, white adults and Latinos are also not where we need them to be. And even among individuals who are regularly vaccinated against the flu, African-Americans are more than twice as likely to report that they would not seek the COVID-19 vaccine. Trust is an issue. Distrust is an issue and it's high for many well-justified reasons. And what happens is we now have this major uphill that battle that we have to address to improve minority health and population health and reduce health disparities. And the COVID-19 infodemic is also a major factor contributing to distrust. So an infodemic is a rapid and far reaching spread of a mix of both accurate and inaccurate information. The information flow is excessive, which makes it really difficult to separate fact from fiction and to have confidence in a solution. And a key concern about the COVID-19 infodemic is particularly this adverse impact that it may have on communities who are most affected. So this is the SEAL Alliance, currently it includes 11 states, we started SEAL this summer, and so we focused on the areas of the country that were then surging. Now we know we have surges all over the country, um, and we're focused on those populations hardest hit. And these are also sites where we have research teams with a reputable track record of community-engaged science, 
who demonstrated that they'd be able to do this work. So these are state-based teams. They're out in communities, out in counties in the states that uh, are listed here. And they're really doing so much important work to really address through a co-learning experience, learning from communities in various ways, such as having focus groups, listening sessions, et cetera. And communities are learning from the field teams through outreach and education activities. And I think this co-learning is important because it leads to co-creation of culturally specific messages and other kinds of interventions that will be tested for effectiveness, which is important, of course, as scientists, we wanna understand if what we're doing is having the impact that we, we want it to have. So this is an investment in communities. It is a multi-sector alliance committed to reducing um, health disparities. So in a very short time, this alliance, both um, you know, the NIH staff and we have research teams, they're firing on all cylinders. And these are just a few examples of many of the things happening in, in communities. This is more of a vaccine focus. And at first we were really thinking about helping to foster clinical trial inclusion, conducting needs assessments, building community awareness about how you can stay healthy. Some of the projects are providing personal protective equipment, hand sanitizer, other resources, just really getting out there, which is tough in the, in the age of COVID to figure out how you can really get into communities to have an impact. But I think SEAL is doing that. And these are just a few of the early metrics, you know, in just a span of about five months, the reach of SEAL is widespread. We have, you know, over 3,500 outreach staff in direct communication who are part of a SEAL research team working to advance this work. Over 2.8 million individuals have received specific COVID-19 educational materials as a result of SEAL. And collectively, these teams across this alliance of 11 states have conducted over 7,600 activities. And the list of activities is here. Some are doing text messaging campaigns, distributing materials. They're having community town halls and other local meetings. Just a lot to really hopefully make a difference. And the SEAL leadership, both within NIH, including the NIMHD director, Dr. Perez Estable, and also Dr. Fauci, NIAID director, who we all know, are working with us on this and working to engage in national and local town halls, Facebook live events, media stories, writing op-eds, and all efforts, anything we can do to get evidence-based information out there about COVID-19, including demystifying COVID-19 vaccines and answering the questions that are on the minds of so many people. So I'm really proud of this work of SEAL, and I know we have a long way to go on it. These are a few resources that, you know, I encourage you to review for accurate information on COVID-19 and also on key initiatives that are part of the NIH scientific response. And, you know, debunking this, mis this misinformation is critical. So I encourage you all to do everything within your domains of, of influence to have a positive impact on this. So now I'm going to transition a little. I also mentioned I want to talk about training. Uh, there's a few things I wanted to make sure that you are aware of. It's important that we train health disparities research to help make critical change in this area. So I wanted to uh, make sure you know about the Health Disparities Research Institute or the HDRI. This is part of the training mission of NIMHD, supporting the uh, research career development of promising and early career um, minority health and health disparities researchers and to stimulate research in these disciplines. So this program is great. It features lectures on minority health and health disparities research. There are small group discussions. There's a mock grant review. There are seminars. Participants have the opportunity to meet with NIH scientific staff who are engaged in this work across NIH. The seminar from 2020, which was virtual, of course, um, covered many topics, including the etiology of disparities, focusing on methods and measurements, um, interventions, and implementation research. They also received consultation on developing their own applications, R21s, R01s, et cetera, to really, I think, help them advance their, their thinking about this. HDRI is intended for applicants with a doctoral degree who are early stage investigators. Um, so applications are accepted from postdocs, fellows, you know, through early stage investigators. So something to keep in mind as you, as your graduate student proceeding in your your, your research career, and um, so it was held virtually, as I mentioned. This gives you an indication of the competitiveness of the program. We had 224 applications last year. 66 people were selected to participate. 
They represented 24 states and also Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. And this is an image that we just really, really appreciate, given that it was virtual, but you can't get that picture that you want standing in front of the building or something with all the participants. So this, these are the pictures that our, our team um, at NIMHD uh, spliced together to show all the people who were represented at, um, at HDRI last year. So there will be another announcement for HD, uh, HDRI 2021 forthcoming. Now, the final thing I want to talk about that I must make sure you're aware of is the um, funding opportunity that NIH has to support the Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation Program, or the FIRST cohort, first cohort program. And the receipt date for this RFA is actually one month from now. It's March 1st. There's still a little time. And the overall objective of FIRST is to create cultures of inclusive excellence at NIH-funded institutions by implementing a set of well-integrated evidence-based strategies for evaluating their impact on pre-specified metrics of institutional culture, inclusion, and diversity. We want to see inclusive excellence, which is a philosophical approach to higher education administration and processes. And it means that we're attending to both the demographic diversity of faculty and students and the need for developing climate and cultures within institutions so that everyone has a chance to succeed in STEM. So the first program will be providing a funding mechanism. These are opportunities for highly resourced institutions and also limited resource institutions to uh, apply independently or in a partnership to come together and develop um, and implement faculty cohort models. So it's the simultaneous hiring of a diverse group of research faculty. And the overall goals and the specific measurable objectives that this program hopes to um, accomplish are in the areas of sustainable institutional culture change, uh, the promotion of inclusive excellence by hiring a diverse cohort of new faculty, and faculty development, mentoring, sponsorship, and promotion. And each institution is going to be responsible for evaluating their own first program. They'll be sharing data with a coordinating center that will also be funded. So this is an opportunity to enhance efforts ongoing to support the careers of underrepresented faculty. Okay, so what I hope I've accomplished during this presentation was to identify longstanding and new health disparities among underserved populations, factors that contribute to health disparities, especially COVID-19, um, provide examples of NIH support for science to do this work, and highlighted the importance of community-engaged science, building pathways for investigators to train to do this work and funding opportunities that might be helpful to bring people into the fold who may or may not be studying health disparities, but who I think can offer important diversity of thought and scientific innovations. And this is just a list of some of the funding opportunities that are active and supported by NIMHD. Many of these mechanisms um, have a community focus and there are opportunities that have an environmental focus as well. And I am very appreciative of your time and the invitation to, to join you. I invite you to connect with NIMHD using various um, platforms, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hooper. Uh, very interesting to uh, talk, at times unsettling. Uh, and uh, I looked, and the, the, the few times that I looked, we had between 40 and 45 people in the audience, uh, which I want to say is one of the better received talks given the COVID uh, schedule changes and everything. This does overlap with some of our classes. Um, folks, please feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat box. I, I think I'll start with one. Um, so, I mean, it, it was amazing that you, tra you transitioned from that staggering statistic of Lat Latinx um, populations having, if I remember correctly, a beyond 50% more death per week compared to a baseline, a five-year baseline. I, I just can't absorb that number, even though I knew these disparities exist. And you transition into what scientists can do, um, which is amazing and great. So I wanna, I wanna see what you think geographers can do, right? Yeah, quantitative geographers, uh, you know, perhaps if I, I'm not, this isn't really not my expertise, but are very good at, let's say, identifying disparities, um, which, you know, we know they exist. Obviously, the, the programs that can be helpful, right, the, 
uh, RADx program or perhaps the way to go to help improve those. Geographers can also look at exposures, which I want to say, my understanding, we kind of have an idea. Let's say the Latinx exposure versus the African American exposure on how they might be different, you know, community housing versus uh, crowded housing and such. But what 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 do you think, and where do you think geographers um, can uh, contribute to um, to this cause? So I, I think in all the ways you just described would be important, and I think that uh, it would be great to have. I, what we need are, are multidisciplinary teams who all bring a different um, lens to the same important and complex questions. Uh, my suspicion is that we don't have enough geographers who are really engaged in these efforts. And I think that that's a, a, missing, uh, a missing piece that would be important to add for all the reasons that you mentioned, in addition to being able to focus on you know, using graphic uh, information systems and, and other kinds of approaches to identify uh, maybe hotspots testing deserts, vaccination deserts, all the things that, that are about kind of the landscape, the, the physical landscape, things about the built environment um, to the extent that, that geographers would, would really be interested in things like, um, you know, environmental exposures would be important. Um, and so I think that there are many opportunities to apply the work of geographers to understanding not only COVID disparities, but, but more about health disparities in general. I mean, the, the, the way that the country is set up and other countries um, really has a lot to do with health disparities. Well, thank you very much. I mean, that, that is encouraging to hear. I always have this voice in my head saying, well, we already know that we have experts and more death rate among the African-American community. Why do we need to find that out again uh, or exposure? We kind of have an idea, really the solution is to invest in these communities in this and that way. Um, but it's encouraging to hear to, uh, to say that we, we can be helpful, especially using GIS analysis. From fact, my students last semester actually looked at um, testing and vaccination in, in Denver. And it turns out minorities have slightly better access to at least the location not the mentality, but yeah, that, that was an interesting observation and perhaps a good job of um, the Tri-County as well as the Colorado Department of Public Health in the Denver area. That was the only area where we looked at. Wow. Uh, yeah, Jennifer Flores is asking, can you review some of the proven methods for countering fears about getting the COVID vaccine or other fears about vaccination in general? So, I mean, I think that vaccine hesitancy is a complex cognitive behavioral issue. It's about decision-making. And, and essentially there are kind of three components if you think about vaccine hesitancy um, and they are confidence, complacency, and convenience. And these are things that um, when you think about vaccines in general, these are the, the factors that kind of comprise this construct that we call vaccine hesitancy. And vaccine hesitancy is important, um, but it doesn't actually even become an issue until the vaccine, whatever the vaccine is, in this case, COVID, is widely available. So right now, the vaccine is not widely available to everyone, right? It's being implemented in phases in priority groups based on risk of mortality. Um, but in general, I think as I'm, a, I'm trained as a psychologist, and so I would... Um, imagine that there are many psychological processes and techniques we can we can employ to assist people with making an informed decision and one that they can feel confident in. I think right now we're we need to combat the infodemic happening and all of the misinformation around COVID that you know that that is spreading. Um, and I always caution individuals that we know so little. This is a new novel virus that has been in existence that in this country for a year now. And so we have fewer answers um, with a lot of project, a lot of projects that are ongoing to address many of these questions. So when someone gives you something definitive about COVID-19 and specifically the vaccine, I would be hesitant to, to believe that unless it's something that the science has actually suggested is true. Um, and so I think what we need to do is to pull back and, and go with the, the evidence on what we know about about this vaccine so far. Um, and that is that it is um, the two that we have authorized, the Moderna vaccine and um, Pfizer's vaccine are mRNA vaccines and they work with really high efficacy 
And although there are side effects, um, most people don't experience any major side effects after the second vaccine is where we're hearing more reports of people saying that they, you know, feel like they need to take the day off um, for a day or two, but it's a safe vaccine. Now, do we know the long term? And that's something that people are worried about. Well, what's gonna what's gonna be the long term health impact of this vaccine? We we don't know yet what those what that might be, but we, you know, many people accept vaccines all the time. You know, we accept vaccinations as kids, you know, and we didn't really think about what company made this vaccine or what, you know, when we get a you know, we get paperwork and we understand that there might be side effects or risks, but we proceed. But with COVID and this sort of heightened distrust that, it, that it's coming in part from misinformation and sort of the sociopolitical climate is really making it hard for people to make informed decisions. So when I talk to people about this, I'm not functioning as a psychologist, but clearly people ask me this kind of question all the time. And I answer their questions honestly. I tell the truth about what we know and also what we don't know. Um, and that way, hopefully, they can make a decision that they will be confident in. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is my own related question. And folks, I don't see questions in chat, so I'll wait if you have any. But but related to this, and I I don't assume that you would know the answer, is where the clinical trials, the phase three trials of these vaccines uh, actually made an effort to um, increase the participation of minorities. And whether those individuals who were part of these trials or being followed up on as um, some sort of connection with the communities that can help establish trust. Um, and if not, what, what other programs? I, I noticed in one of your slides, you, you mentioned that the trust in vaccines is actually uh, you know, higher than September. I assume those are based on surveys because there was no vaccine at the time. Um, but right. I was thinking about these issues as you were, as you were presenting. Is, is there, were, were there enough representative sample of minorities in the clinical trials and are those folks being used to communicate with the community? Great question. And I, I can speak for the NIH is, in, is involved as a part of Operation Warp Speed in supporting that effort. And we worked closely, and I did also directly, with uh, vaccine companies, not Pfizer, um, but certainly with Moderna and, and other companies that are still developing vaccines for this very purpose. You know, our NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins, was very concerned, recognizing that we might have low representation because it's typically low in clinical trials among racial ethnic minorities. This is not, also not a new problem. That's the thing. That it, these are just not new issues. But we wanted to make sure in this case that the representation was such that we could say that the representation was, was respectable, right? So in Moderna's trial, um, I believe the final numbers were about 20%. Uh, Latinos and about 10% African American, and in um, trials that are upcoming, you know, it's it hopefully well we'll see it, it may be a little bit lower, but there have been intentional efforts to make sure that the representation is better. And I have to say, 10, 20% is really good. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, but give, compared to most clinical trials, these are really high numbers. And for me, it wasn't that we were expecting, at least I was not, to find any differences in vaccine effectiveness on the basis of race, because again, race and ethnicity are social, socially constructed categories. They're not biological categories. So we wouldn't expect that, I mean, human bodies are human bodies. We wouldn't expect it to work any differently. However, for the ability to say that we have representation across all groups and they had good experiences, it was really important to make sure everyone's included. And just in general, we want everybody to participate in these things. And, um, so many of the, not many, but some of those individuals, so the Coronavirus Prevention Network, COVPN, is a partner of ours, especially with our SEAL initiative, and they have great resources on their website as well, on the Coronavirus Prevention Network's website, and, and some of those include videos. So some actual research participants uh, who were in the vaccine trials have shared their story, their testimonial in a video or in writing, um, and actually, interestingly, uh, my parents-in-law are both participants in a, a COVID-19 uh, clinical trial. And actually my father is one as well. And so I recently filmed um, like, a, like an interview with uh, them for that purpose. And we'll share it with our, our audience. And, and if you join the NIH, uh, NIMHD listserv, when it's uh, released in a week or two, you'll see it. But we had that conversation to talk about what that was like and why as African-Americans, they were not afraid to raise their hand and participate. And one of the things they communicated 
was that they wanted to be a part of the solution. They wanted to help. They wanted it. They know that this is a historic moment in time. And they wanted to be able to say, we help in some way. And it's important because it's different from many, uh, many people that I know who would never, you know, agree to participate in a trial like that. So I was proud of them. Well, all right. I, I think, uh, I think we have a lot to take home and thank you for, especially for uh, pointing out to the opportunities for our graduate students and faculty. I think that is very precious um, in, in how we can be helpful. Uh, just one question came in from Jessica Voveris is how would you, and they're thanking you for your talk, how would you as a scientist counter the mindset of an official who does not want to share info or, da uh, or data they think the public may not understand? Uh, How would I counter, let me make sure I understand the question. How would I counter the mindset of an official who doesn't wish to be transparent about information? It, that might be part of it, but I think they're explicitly asking if the official thinks that the public may not understand this data and therefore we don't want to share. Well, you know, that, that's a tough question. I think in general, um, it's important that scientific findings are disseminated into the public. The public needs to know what scientists are finding, but it needs to be presented in a way that is digestible and that people understand. I mean, we, we know that many times even, you know, reporters are reporting findings and it may not be exactly the, what was printed, you know, for example, in the, in the peer reviewed publication. Um, so it's important that, and especially as it relates to this, having accurate information, I think in the public is important, especially if it counters, you know, some of the myths that might exist. But it is important to do so in a way that um, individuals of all levels of health literacy can understand. Um, so I would encourage and maybe make a proposal, if it were me, um, to uh, on how we might be able to disseminate information in a way that people can understand. As a follow-up, do, do you at all work with news agencies and organizations? A good example being uh, hydroxy chloroquine, right? When the yeah. peer review paper came out, even I, this is day one, I, I shared the results in my statistics class and we, 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 talk, we talked about sample size and what patients were taken out of the trial and how this might not be really reliable. This is day one, right? Um, and we all know what happened afterwards, but I wonder, and again, we have free press and freedom of speech, but but has this whole preprint industry well approach, while it accelerates science, it really helps us advance faster. Has that created more problems for your team and the messaging that you want to put out there? Um, that's an interesting question. One I haven't really been asked about about the preprint. I mean, I think um, most of, for our research teams who are working within communities. I have not heard that preprints pre, pre are an issue. I think scientists know about preprints, right? And, and access and are reading those and perhaps some journalists as well. Um, and I know that if I'm talking to uh, someone in the press, I'm very careful about you know, uh, things that are preprints and that have not gone through the peer review process. So I think as long as we are um, as transparent as possible about these data and about the status of the science, in terms of this is not a peer review publication, it's just a preprint, or any other limitations of findings. So that, that's the other thing that happens a lot is we're seeing you know, studies come out and it's reported in the press. And sometimes I will look and say, well, but there are limitations that were not mentioned that would be important um, to consider. So things that help put the findings in better context are always important to, you know, I think, point out. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hooper, please wait uh, with us for a second. I want to th thank you for this great talk and all the great information pointers for faculty and students. Um, uh, folks who are on YouTube, thank you for all the messages and say hi. Next week at noon, we have characterizing land cover and vegetation dynamics using earth observation systems by Dr. Khatami. This is part of our joint colloquium with ATOC, GIAC, um, GIAL, and INSTAR. Um, so I will see you all hopefully next week at noon uh, and uh, have a great and safe weekend. Bye. Thanks again, Dr. Hooper. Thank you. All right. So I'll end the stream.